Hello, welcome to the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. We're here today with uh, writer Chris Fink, a Wisconsin author, a short story writer, uh, and welcome to everyone who's joining us on Zoom. I know some folks just got into the room here on Zoom, so I'll just repeat that one more time. This is uh, the Central Wisconsin Book Festival event with Wisconsin fiction writer Chris Fink. Welcome. Um, I'm Jill Stukenberg. I'm one of the Central Wisconsin Book Festival committee members, and I'm going to in introduce our author shortly. Um, and as you're also joining the Zoom call, I just like to say a couple things to help orientate you to Zoom if this is your first time. Um, you, uh, we do have your microphones muted. Um, later, um, after the reading, if you have a question for the author, you can write it in the chat, and, and that's how you can communicate with us. You can turn on your video camera if you like. That um, that's kind of fun, and I don't know, maybe gives the author someone to see too. Um, so you're you're welcome, but you don't have to turn on your video camera. Um, in some cases, that's something that reduces folks' bandwidth. Uh, the other last tip you might want to know is you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. If you want to experiment with that, you can speaker view, you will see the face of the person who's speaking primarily. Gallery view, you see uh, other people who are on the call, sort of Brady Bunch style. So that's at the top right hand side of, of your screen. All right, and I'm also going to start here by playing a um, one minute video to thank our sponsors. Then we'll come back and introduce Chris Fink and get started. And this video is also, um, just so folks know, going to be re recorded um, and available then at least for a brief time on our website at the library. So first, here's um, a word from our sponsors. Um. I'm so sorry I had to pause right there. Uh, were you able to hear that? And if not, Chad, I'm going to ask you to play it. I um, yeah. I seem to don't I don't have the option on my screen right now to share the sound, and I'm not sure why. So no instead, if thank you. you. Stop stop your screen share. I can start mine, and we'll run the video. You got it. Could you all could you all hear that? <laughs> Did you see that? I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, I don't know if you were sharing at all, Chad. Oh we no! Couldn't. I'm so sorry. Here it is. <laughs> Here you it know, is. I, my apologies, everybody. Um, well, we have a lot of sponsors, and uh, we thank them, and we won't delay things anymore. <laughs> uh, my apologies, everybody. We can share show it at the end, or check out our website, the mcpl.us/cwbf. If you click on the partners uh, section of the page, you can see everybody who helped us out. My apologies. <laughs> Peace. Thanks. All right. Well, Zoom, anyway, go Zoom ahead. Zoom fun. Yeah, Good. Zoom I'd like fun. to, in I'll introduce our author, Chris Fink. We're so pleased that he's here with us today. Chris Fink is the author of two short story collections, Farmer's Almanac, a work of fiction, uh, 2013, and this book, which is called Add This to the List of Things That You Are uh, from 2019. He's a professor of English and environmental studies at Beloit College and editor-in-chief of the Beloit Fiction Journal. A journal editor for more than 20 years, Fink founded two national short story prizes, the John Steinbeck Award and the Hamlin Garland Award. Recent stories of his have appeared in the Mississippi Review, New Orleans Review, and Witness. 
He is also a regular contributor to Northern Public Radio, where he produces monthly radio essays about the intersection of the self and the natural world. And let's, uh, let's now hear from, from Chris Fink. And like I said, at the end, we'll have some time for questions, which we can take from the chat. Thank you, Chris. Oh, hang on a second, Chris. We've got to unmute you as well. Just one moment. There we go. I was just, I was just enjoying the show here. <laughs> Thanks very much for the nice uh, introduction, uh, uh, Jill. It's nice to meet you, and thank you, Chad. Um, and thank you to the sponsors that we didn't get to see. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. I see a couple students out there, so it's nice to have us some uh, friendly, at least I hope they're friendly, um, faces in the audience and uh, meet some new folks as well. I was excited for this invitation. Great lineup of events you have, good writers uh, from Wisconsin. I'm excited to meet some new Wisconsin writers and some good family stuff. I know we're, we're going to go see the bird, the ornithologist tomorrow. We're uh, amateur bird watchers at my house, so my daughter's excited about that. Yeah. And then you got Joy Harjo. So. Uh, awesome. Thanks for all this. Um, I appreciate it. This is my first Zoom uh, reading. I gave several readings uh, over the months after my book came out a year ago, uh, but then things happened in, in March and that all died. So um, happy to be back doing this. So I'm going to introduce my uh, books a little bit and then I'm going to read for about 20 minutes from uh, a couple different stories. So I just want to say a little bit about uh, the, the project and uh, how it came to be and then I'll tell you more about the stories. Um, so my first book is Farmer's Almanac, and this is a, um, uh, what some people call a sequential novel or linked stories, and it's set in a fictional county in Wisconsin called uh, Odette County. Um, and these are rural stories sort of uh, uh, centered on class and, um, and uh, sort of themes of work and, and small town community. Um, they're pretty dark. Um, there's no copyright on titles, so I came up with this title because it's, and I organized it kind of like a Farmer's Almanac, and I thought, geez, if just 1% of the people who buy the Farmer's Almanac um, regularly make the mistake and buy mine, I'll have enough to go to the farmer's market. So, um, and then the reason I said that is because this, this, uh, this book, Add This to the List of Things You Are, which came out from the University of Wisconsin in uh, September, is in a way a, a, a sequel, or <laughs> it's kind of, it, it it, there's a lot of the same kind of characters. Um, these are often not characters you, you root for. They're sort of complicated uh, uh, people. Uh, um, there's some deplorable characters in here. Um, but uh, um, most of the stories aren't set in Wisconsin. They're sort of uh, Midwestern types, but they're sort of <laughs> flung out of, of the Midwest. And so many of the stories take place in foreign countries or foreign places like California. Uh, and um, so a lot of Midwestern characters, but out of their element and sort of struggling to, to you know, um, deal with the new circumstances. So that's kind of how the, the works sort of uh, follow one another. And um, in general, I'm interested in, in the Midwestern literature, um, Midwestern uh, characters, and I seem to be drawn to that, who knows why. Um, Flannery O'Connor said, you can choose what to write about, but you can't choose what, to breathe li what you breathe life into. And this must be what I breathe life into. So, um, I'm also editor of the Blight Fiction Journal. Really great annual compilation of the best, some of the best fiction in the country edited uh, here at Blight College um, by me and some of my students. And here I am in my office at Blight College where I get uh, good reception, good Wi-Fi. And Okay, I'm about ready to start. The first, I'm going to read uh, sections of two stories, and I've got a wedding theme going for you here today. So the first story is a wedding, and the second story um, is a honeymoon. And uh, um, so there you go. I found a way to organize this. There are. Um, I'm going to read just just scenes within these two larger stories, um, just to give you a taste for, for the uh, the book. The first one is set in Wisconsin, and the second one is set in, in uh, Spain. And the first story I'm going to read is called Whistle or Lose It. And this is a, a story of a, of a country wedding. And as I was talking, meeting Jill before this, she had read that story. She said, oh, I think we've been to the same, some of the same country weddings. So this is kind of a, um, you know, there's a lot of conflict in this wedding scene. I'm going to read you 
maybe some of the softer moments. But the main character is a guy named Timothy. He's in his mid-20s. He's a teacher, amateur photographer, and he kind of doesn't fit in very well with his family. Um, he's kind of educated himself away from his uh, family, and they're, they're more, he sees them as sort of brutish and, and um, uh, not very logical. And uh, the story opens, uh, it, there's a pig roast at the wedding, and the, the, the wedding is his sister's second wedding. And um, his brother had said, well, it's their second wedding. It doesn't count anyway, which is sort of one of the one of the um, germs for where the story came from. So he start he shows up. He he skips the courthouse. It's a courthouse wedding. Family's not too happy about that. Shows up at the pig roast. The guys are all standing around drinking beer in the morning, roasting the pig, and they're kind of rough on him. Um, you know, he's a little softer and, and uh, um, not as tough as his uh, as his. Uh, the other family members and their friends and they sort of punish him for that but then after then afterwards he sort of escapes to go visit the women who are up in the farmhouse uh, cooking food but he's afraid that they're not going to be very nice to him either and that's where the story picks up and this goes for about 10 minutes just in the middle of the story one of the guys is named Nicky and he um, has has um, poached a turkey and he's cooking it with the uh, with the pig as Nikki plucks the dead hen, Timothy heads for the house where his sister and the other women fret with what Sack calls the fixins. Sack is the guy who's uh, roasting the pig. There's a company called Roast a Shoat, um, and this guy named Sack is the uh, head of the Roast a Shoat, but he doesn't do anything but the pig. The women fret with what Sack's call, Sack calls the fixins, the slaw and beans and potatoes and what all that garnish the pig. Sack doesn't do fixins, he says. He leaves them, them fixins for the women. He's relieved to be free of the crowd. He's relieved to be free of the stag party at the roast to show, but not so certain the fixins crowd will be any friendlier, especially since he skipped the courthouse. Last year's straw bales hugged the limestone foundation of the farmhouse. It's August, mind. Up past the house, the acreage forms a pleasing tableau. High golden hills reaching above the silo top, gnarled burr oaks shading the pasture land. It makes an appeal, appealing tab portrait, sure, but it won't make money so it won't be permanent. It's a dream, this farm, and what's worse, it's a rental. Last tenant on this property tipped his tractor, raking hay right on that ridge. The man was crushed beneath the weight of, the, of his implement. That was why the rent was cheap. One week a funeral, and the next a wedding. It was like some made-for-TV Midwest Gothic, roast a show for every occasion. Arriving at the farmhouse, Timothy's verdict rises like bile for the second time since his arrival. No fucking way this works. Timothy's prescience is what his family calls his cynicism. Old Timmy frowns a lot, his mother used to say. The question to Timothy isn't how his, he knows failure when he sees it. The question is how his family seems blind to it. Here's his new brother-in-law, 40 years old, once bankrupt, twice divorced, and he's got this way of gazing into his beer cup like he's worried where the next beer will come from before he's finished with the one in his fist. Why bank on failure? Timothy had asked his mother when Anita, that's the sister, announced the marriage, pointing out the many clear flaws in the agreement. Gust, Gust is the, 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 the brother-in-law, the one who just got married. Gust is a likable man, Timothy's mother said. The world is full of likable men, Timothy said. Doesn't mean you want to spend the rest of your life with them. You don't have to, his mother said. It took this a moment to sink in. She was right, of course. Timothy didn't have to. He didn't even have to be here at the wedding. Sure, it would look bad if he skipped the whole day. He could, however, invent an excuse, some summer school. But something about his family made Timothy come round, despite everything he knew, despite his grim prediction. It wasn't morbidity or fatalism, the title pull one feels to witness a train wreck. He suspects the answer is very nearly the opposite of that. Somehow, against the odds, these people, his family, are happy people. They have some secret wellspring of faith, that things will work out for the better. Whereas Timothy, well, Timothy's nobody's version of a happy person. As if to ratify his thought, thought, Timothy hears a whinny rise from the barn, a horse laugh, all right. That would be Woe Boy. Woe Boy is Cord's plug, Cord's his brother. Won in a poker game a few months ago. I've got the kind of brother who wins a horse in a poker game, was Timothy's first appraisal of the news. Guy was into him for a grand, and brother of mine takes a fucking horse for lucre. Never mind, he's got no place to put it. Well, had no place to put it. This doomed union provided cord pasturage, but the point remains. 
It's a $2,000 horse, Cord had explained when Timothy questioned his judgment. He acted as if the currency could be converted to U.S. horse to one U.S. dollar. Cord saw the horse as a $2,000 worth of animal, while Timothy saw the horse for what it was, a useless hay burner. It's hard for Timothy to forgive Cord's naive childishness. He's older by five years after all, and everyone likes him more. How come Cord made such a dumb move and no one calls him on it? Probably, probably because his dumb move makes him happy. Also, who doesn't love a man with a horse? Cord's impulsive, but he's quick to love and he's got a big heart for other suckers. So it comes to this. Timothy's the kind of brother who holds his brother's happiness against him. No wonder Cord hates him. For Cord certainly does hate him. There have been a lifetime of beatings and belittlings to prove it. But which kind of brother is worse? Holding this thought, Timothy steps over the threshold from the porch into the mudroom. It smells stale, sour, the cow barn once removed. The milking bigs, bibs are hung on their hooks. The shitty boots all lined up on newspaper that doesn't quite perform its function. The linoleum sprinkled with lime and straw and the ubiquitous little flecks of shit. A cow cane, gentlemanly in aspect, leans into a corner. Perched above a row of seed caps, Pioneer, Garst, the Timothy's old favorite, DeKalb, the flying corn. From the mudroom, Timothy can see part of the kitchen and what passes for a dining room but he can't see the business end of the kitchen where he hears the women at their chores. Hello, the house, Timothy calls. He waits for a feminine reply. Plus my spectacles, a quavering voice, masculine. It's the old gent, Timothy's dad, come through the dining room in here with the women. They've been at it all day, he says. I'm just keeping an eye on things. Keeping an eye on the ball game, comes his mother's voice from across the room. What's that, mother? Timothy's dad is growing steadily hard of hearing. Never mind. The old gent is of an age that he can easily move among the family's factions. He's also of the age that no one expects much of him. He's been relieved of the men's work, put out to pasture, so to speak, but he hasn't been asked to take up the women's work, neither here nor there. Timothy's own family station. The difference is that his father is much beloved. The women dote on him because he was so selfless in raising the family, whereas with Timothy, no one expects much because he can't provide much. Some men might balk at their diminished role, feel henpecked. Timothy's dad doesn't mind the soft treatment. At, his, at this moment, he's quite content. It is, after all, his only daughter's wedding, even if it is a do-over. Big day, the old gent says, and you're looking kind of shaggy. Want me to count some of that off for you? He makes his cold fingers into scissors at Timothy's neck. No thanks, Dad, Timothy says. Starting already? The old gent nods at the half-empty cup and beer cup in Timothy's hand. You know what they say, Timothy says, raising his voice in his cup. What's that? Timothy's still standing on the threshold of the mudroom. He steps in now and looks across the kitchen at the row of female backsides. If only he had his camera. They're lined up like bridesmaids from biggest to smallest. His mother, his sister, Anita, Jess, who's Gus's preteen daughter from his first marriage. Gus's mother, what's her name? Lorraine. How's the fixins? Timothy calls to the women. Where have you been? Anita asks. She doesn't turn around. She's wearing her wedding gown yet. It was their mother's gown. Timothy recognizes it from a picture. This hand-me-down wasn't good enough for her first wedding, a regular church affair almost a decade ago. But for this second wedding, the old dress seems fitting. It's silk. A faded pearl now, more yellow than white, with sequins and a train. Her auburn hair hangs in flouncy, flouncy ringlets over her shoulders. She's lovely in the dress. Well, she asks. I was outside with the cavemen. Jess giggles. She's nearly grown, looking more like Anita's sister than her new daughter. She's got her hair done the same way. You know what I mean. Before, where were you? I had to work. In the summer, that's a new one for you. Aha. Would have been nice if someone took pictures. A girl only gets married once or twice, you know. Anita's still not looking at him. None of the women are. You didn't have a photographer? You're a photographer. I have a camera is all. I'm sorry. You know I'm not a photographer. Should be. Should be a photographer. Should be sorry.
His sister turns to him, holding a heavy mushroom-colored casserole in a clear dish, pyrite, pyrex, something. She looks beautiful, younger. Her eyes sparkle. She's wearing a sassy blue apron that reads, yes, I do, but not with you. Here, she says, carry this to the table. Timothy accepts the heavy dish. Ow, shit, he says. His sister has been using potholders. Timothy is barehanded. Ow, freak, scalding. He shoves it back to her and puts his fingers in his mouth. Oh, you're a wimp, Anita says. She looks at him when she says this. She doesn't smile. Here, wait, he says, recovering. He reaches under her hands and takes the potholders, the casserole, everything. There, I've got it. Put it in the other room, she says. Then put on an apron, we'll clear out. Timothy, Timothy carries the casserole to the dining room and adds it to the oilcloth gathering of other slum gullions, his mother's word. In their unmatched dishes, the green bean casserole, the cream corn casserole, the potato salad, the 15 beans, the slaw, all these familiar bland dishes together on the table form a unified front. His make-do family, don't expect too much for yourself, the slum gullions warn. Don't put on the dog. Don't be smart. Don't get bit too big for your britches. You deserve exactly this. This is a plentitude. Okay, I'm gonna stop there on that story and then I'm gonna move forward toward the end of the book. So give me just a second here and tell you about the next one. That story, by the way, is called Whistle or Lose It. It's the first one in the book. And now I'm going on to a story called Troll Way. That was the wedding here, we're coming up to the honeymoon. Just about there. Okay. How's everyone doing? I should have asked this a long time ago, but you hear me okay, I hope. <laughs> Good, all right. Um, so our next story is called Trollway, and this is a, it's, it's set in Spain, on the north coast of Spain, San Sebastian. And, um, thanks Rob. And uh, the main character is a, a, a woman, uh, she's 30 years old, and uh, uh, she's just gotten married uh, to, uh, uh, and she's a kind of a country girl. She's from a town called Mount Horeb in Wisconsin, which is outside of uh, Madison. And uh, there's a place in Mount Horeb called the Troll Way, where they people carve trolls and they put them along the, um, they put them along the main street and you come and look at them. And the the, the uh, main character, the um, uh, point of view character, uh, her mother has died, and she th thought of her as the one of the trolls. She called her the troll queen troll along um, along uh, the troll way. And her, her new husband is more sophisticated. He's an urbanite, he's from California. Um, here's the, the sort of urban rural divide that takes place in a lot of these stories. And he's just gotten a job with the foreign service. And so the, they're, um, they've taken their honeymoon and they, they have a sort of short stop, a month long stay in San Sebastian uh, for language training. And then he's gonna get a permanent training, a permanent placement in the foreign service um, after this. So they're, he's working, she's not, and this is, they see this as their honeymoon. But the problem is as soon as she gets there, she starts to develop her, a rash. And um, her mother has warned her about weddings, um, wanted her to stay single, and her mother says, no secrets survive a honeymoon. Um, and so that's kind of stuck with, with her. And she begins to suspect she's having a good time at first, you know, exploring the new city, doing the honeymoon thing. And then pretty soon she's so miserable because her body's covered in a rash. And uh, she goes to the doctor, and um, she goes to the pharmacy, she tries different things. Her first doctor is a female, she asks her personal questions, she can't figure out what's going on. And uh, she starts to suspect that she's allergic to her husband, whose name is Ricky. And she's like, oh fuck, I'm, here I am uh, with my uh, new husband on honeymoon, I'm allergic to him, and um, that's what's going on. Ricky, meanwhile, is sort of clueless. He's, he's um, you know, doesn't have any rash, and he's kind of happy-go-lucky. 
this story is uh, in the second person. So you're really stuck in the head of this woman uh, as she's experiencing all this. And so I'm going to pick it up in the story where she's, um, she's about to go to another doctor. She's gone, you know, um, she's at her wit's end and she's gone to uh, doctors and pharmacies and she's about, just about to go to a new doctor. Okay, this is Trollway. Um, you put yourself to sleep. To put yourself to sleep, you try counting spots. In the darkness, you feel your fingertips. You feel with your fingertips the angry braille of your skin. How many had you counted the first time a few days ago? You count the spots on your groin and lose track somewhere north of 100. You look at your husband with a mixture of worry and disdain. Where, pray tell, are Ricky's spots? Your eruption, this is the Spanish word, erupción. Um, so she calls it her eruption. Your eruption, you finally concede, is not poison ivy. That was her first thought. The spots don't seem to be spreading as much as multiplying. There are simply more and more. The next morning, you will go back to the hospital. With that simple decision made, you worry no longer and fall asleep. You have a different doctor this time who doesn't give knowing looks or ask tricky metaph metaphysical questions. Typical man, he's all business, and within minutes of entering his office, you're bent over a gurney, receiving a hydrocortisone shot in your backside. Walking home, you realize Holy Week has been passing without your realizing it. The last part of the processions weave through the Parte Vieja, the, that's the old part of town where their honeymoon is. The, participate, the participants dressed like clansmen in their white robes and masked conical hoods. You're stuck for a long time in the slow procession behind two hooded pallbearers carrying one of the grisly floats of the crucifixion. The float is heaped with a blinding array of white gladiolas and calla lilies. Your hip hurts where you got the shot, and you would like to crawl into one of the floats and be borne along slowly. Instead, you find yourself in lockstep with the procession, tilting from one stiff leg to the other, in time with the rigid pallbearers. By the time you get home and undress for bed, the spots have blanched. They don't itch anymore. You're so tired. Ricky, too, stays home. He mixes a pitcher of mojitos, closing the blinds against the Holy Week processions, and watches the steamy telenovelas in Spanish. You sleep 12 hours that night. The spots abate. The next day, the narcotic apparently wearing off, you get some energy back. For the first time in more than a week, you're not bone tired. All the fretting from before begins to seem like silliness. The next night, you and Ricky go out to dinner. It's a warm summery night, so you choose an intimate outdoor plaza hidden in the old city. You haven't been out to dinner in some time. You toast to the end of the dreadful eruption, which is somehow not contagious. Ricky jokes that you must be the only one who's allergic to marriage, but now you're breaking down, resigning yourself to the inevitable. Ricky grins. Truly, he says, I'm glad you ha to have you back. I'm sorry you've been laid low by the mopes or whatever they are, but that's all over now. You smile. Maybe Ricky's right. Maybe he's always been right. He orders another bottle of wine and you toast your future. You have only a couple of weeks left in here in Spain, then back to the trollway to pack your lives. In two months, you could be living in any of the world's 23 Spanish-speaking countries. Salud! Whereas in the past, thinking of this has made you nervous, now it makes you giddy. If you had your choice of countries, well, that could be nerve-wracking. But you don't have to choose. The choice has been made for you, and you've simply got to go along. You must go along, and there's some comfort in that. You'll be assigned to a country, and that country will be home. It will be a surprise, something like a destiny, but quite, not quite as permanent. There is no pressure on you. You're not responsible, after all, if the placement turns out to be a disaster. As you get ready to leave, a breeze arises. <laughs> San Sebastian's right on the coast. The salt sea air refreshes your blemished skin, blowing away the warm, stale air trapped in the city. Within a matter of seconds, the breeze gathers into a wind, and then, rather suddenly, into an alarming gale. Plastic tables wobble and tip. Silverware clatters onto the cobbles, and placement settings take flight. You and Ricky, along with the other diners, hold onto your glasses, and each of you has to take shelter beneath the portico Shrieks of delight and surprise accompany the sudden change in climate. Seconds more, and tables and chairs are skidding across the courtyard. Shrieks, sounds of shattering glass fill the courtyard, and the tenor of the shrieks changes from rapture to terror. Everyone is hanging on to something solid. 
You've never had the sensation before that the wind could pick you up and blow you away. You drop Ricky's hand and grab the stone threshold. A disaster is imminent. At any moment, you will be swept through the old stone portal of the plaza and out to sea. But the wind dies, turns to rain mixed with a few hard nuggets of hail. Disaster is averted. Only things are broken. Some of the diners are crying. You leave the stoic waiters to reassemble their lives. Wet and cold, you cling to your husband the whole walk home. At the old port below your apartment, you're surprised to see a group of young Spanish boys swimming shirtless in the deep water along the high harbor wall. What are they doing in the water on a night like this? The boys call out to you, reaching up out of the water and shouting. Are they calling for help? Ricky seems to know what they want. Watch this, he says, and flips a silver coin into the water. The boys dive for the coin, reaching it before it hits the bottom, and one comes up holding the shiny reward. Otra vez, the boys shout, and Ricky flips more treasure into the harbor. For the first time in two weeks, you don't itch anywhere. Even the throbbing has subsided. You feel as if you have lived a whole life in these few weeks. Your mother warned you you would learn a secret. On her honeymoon, she learned that your father wore a hairpiece. He was balding prematurely and had managed to hide it all through their courtship. During a honeymoon, however, all secrets are aired. Perhaps you have learned your secret. It has more to do with you than Ricky. You're a small town girl, after all, pretending to be a grown woman in a bigger world. Everything you know very well at all lies between the two ends of a single street. The eruption wasn't so bad. Your mother would call it a slight hitch in your get along. Now a strong dose of hydrocortisone and the elements have cured you. That night, invigorated by the parallel sensations of grace and danger, you make love. But because of your eruption, there are precious few places safe to touch. You keep your eyes away from the mirrors and all they reveal. The lights are dim and your body's covered by sheets. The next day, you wake up at noon and your husband is sleeping next to you. You haven't slept until noon since you were in high school. You don't feel lazy, however, or mischievous, as if you've gotten away with something. You stretch, yawning the sleep away, stretching your arms to the ceiling. You blink. There on your arm, your other arm, is a line of fresh red spots. The skin is raised around the spots, and they have a heartbeat all their own. Your own heartbeat quickens. Ricky is a snoring lump beside you. He truly is a boy yet, with no regard for life's dangers. You want to wake him, but at the same time, you want to stay sleeping while you make your decision, while you make your own decision. Almost anything can set off an allergic reaction you know well. You can even catch a face full of poison ivy from wood smoke or from the fur of your pet. Your mother at the last had hives in her throat. You think carefully about this whole mess, how it started. This is a mystery that you can solve by certain clues. At first, all mental trails led back to Ordizia and the noxious Spanish weed that must have been lurking there among the wildflowers. Now you see that all trails lead back to the man sleeping next to you. The wise doctor asked, where are you sleeping? Her sage question was another way of asking, how well do you know your husband? Implicit in the question was the answer. Harboring some disease, your new husband has been injecting you with his poison in unrelenting bursts. Perhaps. You continue to ponder. What if your translation was wrong? What if she had asked, where do you sleep? The way your mother asked the first time you stayed all night with a boy, as if to suggest you were a dirty girl who had done a hideous thing. For the first time you think of the question quite literally, removing poor Ricky from the equation entirely. You are sleeping in a foreign country in a strange apartment in this strange bed and on these strange pillows. You roll over to examine the cream colored pillow. Looking closely at the pillow, you see two small red spots, blood stains, the size of pin pricks. In the sheets, you find more of these stains. You ruffle the bedding, and from the folds falls a, falls a small brown insect. It's been crushed, not a spider. It looks more like a deer tick. You pinch the bug in your fingers and drop it on the nightstand. You're on your knees now on the king-sized bed, peering into the sheets. Get up, you say to Ricky. 
Ricky rolls over and yawns. What time is it? He says, it's noon. Get up. I'm looking for something. Ricky does as he's told. He yawns and stretches, then just stands there, staring at you. Your nose inches from the sheets. Your fingers, tweezers. Who let this crazy woman into my bedroom? He says. All right, I'm stopping there. Awesome. Thank you. This is the part where I, I don't know if it'd be cool if we had a clapping sound to play, but we're all just like clapping for a few minutes. Uh, picture us clapping. Uh, awesome. Really cool. I'm sorry you can't hear the force of our, our clapping. <laughs> um, thank you. Really, that was fantastic. I have been enjoying your collection so much. I just have to say that before I field a few questions your way. It's it's really fantastic. It um, it And I I would just love the two excerpts you chose to pair together because uh, once you announced them as being the two you were going to read from, I thought, oh, what a, I hadn't, that, those are great to go together. Those two are wonderful. Um, they have the wedding thing in common, but also, um, you know, something I thought we definitely want to talk about here, which is, uh, you know, writing about the Midwest, right? And, and um, both of those stories, the one shows us, you know, uh, the the narrator at you know his sister's second wedding, he's a Midwesterner, but he feels uncomfortable with the other Midwesterners. Like he he feels like he's the odd man out, even though mm -hmm. to any outsider's perspective he certainly belongs there, right? But he you know at, at one point you say he his family can't imagine failure, right? They seem to have an optimism that that's just mm -hmm. one personality characteristic that he doesn't feel like he shares. And then in the second story, the narrator is the Midwesterner who is out of her element in Spain and hanging out with the urbane, you know, foreign service types and her, her new husband. And, and she feels out of her element there. Um, and it, it's just so interesting that both of these folks feel out of their elements, even when one is in supposedly the element. And I mean, I'm, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm, a, you know, Midwestern. So I, I relate to that feeling of feeling like out of your element, but I, I wonder if that's, um, I don't know if that's like a connection be you see between those two stories or if you could just speak about what is it like to write about Midwestern people? Is there, mm -hmm. are there shared sensibilities that you find for folks in our region? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I taught a, I taught a, um, a course called how to talk Midwestern uh, uh, last year at Blake college and a couple of, I see a couple of my students are here and they were in that class mm -hmm. and we started off the class, like what makes someone Midwestern? Um, mm -hmm. we, we had come up with a great list and one of them, this is really sad. So one of them was like Midwesterners like to give hugs. So now we're, now we're like with, with uh, uh, COVID times, no hugging. So we, we yeah. sort of robbed of one of our, our characteristics. Um, but uh Anyway, there was a great list there. And I remember when I, I lived for several years in California and people used to say to me, oh, you're so Midwestern. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, because it was, a, you know, I grew up, I also grew up in a, grew up in a small town in the Midwest and I traveled a lot and lived other places. But, uh, you know, this was the, the, you know, the water I was swimming in. So I didn't know that there was a certain, there were certain traits of Midwestness. Um, and uh, so I think, um, one of the conflicts in the book, as you, as you, one of the recurring conflicts of the book, as you pointed out, is sort of, um, you know, this this sort of Midwestern. Some of them are just kind of portrayed as bumpkins a little bit um, in in more sort of urban settings, but uh, um, feeling out of place everywhere. There's this writer I like, uh, Paul mm -hmm. Theroux, and he said, uh, uh, "Being a stranger is what made uh, you know, a sense of being a stranger is what made me a writer." And mm -hmm. I think for me, kind of like, um, I mean, this is all you know, not necessarily autobiograph autobiographical, but a part of my, who I am, I guess, someone who's, um, uh, you know, as a first generation college student who's now a professor, you know, feeling a little bit out of place in, in both worlds, um, kind of, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I uh, don't know if I answered your question, but I said some things. No, you, no, you did. I, 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 first of all, I think that class sounds fascinating, right? How to talk yeah. Midwestern. That sounds wonderful. Um, and, uh, but and it nicely leads to something else about travel. Um, it that Paul Thoreau quote is really cool. Um, just this idea that travel, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of the stories take place like with travel, or or in some cases it's, it's a character. Sometimes it's short trip, like the, the guys who go to Chicago for the Cubs game in one of your stories, and other cases it's the voice of someone who lives somewhere else, like the the voice of the the person in um, New New Zealand. Um, 
I guess I want to just travel and uh, help you to write or inspire you to write. Do you write more often when you're traveling? Uh, and do you think it's because of that feeling of being a stranger? Or is it because of the new sights and the new sounds that are like fodder for the imagination? Or, yeah. or maybe you don't write when you travel. Maybe that's when you take a break. I don't know. Yeah, uh, good question. Well, you know what, this is kind of lame, but I keep a journal mostly when I'm traveling, um, you know, because you're just feeling that, you know, all the new um, uh, sights and sounds and feelings. And um, I don't so much when I'm home, which is lame. You, should, you know, you should keep a journal all the time. And, um, um, you know, I think, you know, and also I'm, I, like a lot of people who grew up in the Midwest, I grew up kind of longing to be somewhere else, especially if you're from a town, a small town in the Midwest, you know that you're from Nowheresville, nothing important has ever happened here, nothing important is ever going to happen to you. Um, so that sense of like, you know, longing to be somewhere else, I mean, I, you know, I studied maps a lot, <laughs> and uh, love to travel from an early age. So, um, but I guess, and I love to write about place and settings. And so if I can, I feel like if I get to know a place, you know, well enough, um, then I can so I often think about place first before um, sometimes before story or I'll you know like man I've spent enough time in Spain I ought to be able to get a story out of Spain but then sometimes it'll come back to like some little snippet of dialogue you know mm -hmm. I was at this really awful uh second wedding in in uh Las Vegas where this was a friend a friend of mine from high school his sister was getting remarried and we were supposed to have a big party with the family and the father of the bride stayed awake all night he owned the t town bar where i was from stayed awake all night and he gambled away all the money for the party and you know in the morning it was like noon and he was sitting in his room and the blinds were closed and he was mm -hmm. defeated <laughs> and his wife was hollering at him and he's like ah it's her second wedding it don't count anyway and i was like oh mm -hmm. and, but that line just stuck with me and then mm -hmm. um, so you hear something like that you can't quite forget it um mm -hmm. and so then that sort of like oh here's i want to set something in spain and uh, Ooh, but I've got this line in my head that I need to use in a story and you know so that's kind of how they one of the ways they percolate wow thanks for yeah thanks for sharing that that's awesome how um th just to, to look back at the germ of a story after you've seen it or when you first read it as a fully finished thing and that was a question that came in on chat by the way I just want to reiterate for folks if you've got questions you can put them in the chat one person definitely wanted to know have you been to spain um and why set the story in spain and so it sounds like you have did you specifically stay in that that town in north of san sebastian or or how how much um i don't know did you have to do extra research or do you not care about research i mean i i know there's also writers who are like eh, if the details are ballpark it's fine too no, no, I want to get stuff right. Yeah, I spent okay. quite a bit of time in Spain. When I was in California, I taught for a semester in England, and I was uh, really interested in Spain. I was, um, uh, you know, I had to give a lecture on Hemingway and um, mm -hmm. at this big, you know, uh, um, festival in Italy, and like all the Hemingway experts were going to be on there. And I was like, mm -hmm. I was brand new. I was still in my 20s. I was a brand new professor. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> better learn something. So I um, left from England, my teacher, and then I was spending time in Spain and, and just traveling to some of the places, some of the locales that he had lived uh, uh, for some of his books. So The Sun Also Rises takes part in part in, in San Sebastian. Mm -hmm. It was also a little writing retreat for me because I didn't want to like jet around Spain seeing the sights. I wanted to kind of hang out in one region. Um, and I just, you know, you know, using the Lonely Planet and, and and places that Hemingway had been picked this place and then hunkered down there for a while and was writing and, and spending time there. Yeah. Nice. And I speak enough Spanish just to get by there. So it's a little bit less than, you know, you go to travel to a lot of countries, but you know, if you want to stay someplace for a while, you want to at least feel like you're, you know, you're not totally out there and you can converse mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. We have um, a question that, uh, two questions have come in. Um, one um, person is wondering about, uh, noticed in your bio that you chair the environmental studies program at Beloit College and was wondering about um, if that, how that influences your fiction or if it does. And the sub question was, does the bleak state of environmental affair, of affairs lead to the threat of melancholy running through your fiction? <laughs> yeah, I don't know which came first. Uh, the melancholy has probably always been there, but maybe um, mm -hmm. that's a great question. You know, for uh, you know, I've, I've always felt like a person who's sort of close to this sounds kind of corny, but close to nature. I spend a lot of time outside. I'm, I'm uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. 
healthful and, and restorative for me and you know given my brothers that's where i would be um and then uh, but that's always been a separate part of my life from my academic life and my um and my fiction which is very, very place oriented. I, I even, you know, set of the Midwest or wherever it is, I, I really drill down into place and try to, you know, find uh, locations and, and um, connections between character and place because I, you know, I believe that we have those connections and also it's good for mm -hmm. fiction writing, you know, just to, mm -hmm. I mean, it's good for writing to have character connected to place. So, um, but then, you know, I was teaching at Beloit College for quite a while and, and you know, uh, these separate parts of my life, you know, the sort of you know, outdoor me and and, and um, my fiction writing, which is, you know, modernist, you know, a little experimental, but um, it's not really environmentalist. Um, but I teach also journalism and I've been a journalist and, um, you know, a little secret, if you're teaching at a small college, you can really be a professor of whatever you want. Um, if you're willing to, you know, if you're willing to, you know, put in the time. And I, you know, over the years started to find, you know, creative links between my, what I'd like mm -hmm. to do for fun and, and my um, academic life. And that sort of, I started teaching nature writing more. Um, I teach a course called Writing Wilderness in, in the Boundary Waters in the summer. And um, I helped, and I looked at our environmental studies program, which was very science, very science um, biased, right? You had to take mm -hmm. statistics and all these things that just scared the, scared the writers away. And so we created a new track in the environmental hum humanities um, called environmental arts and communication, which is kind of, you know, um, I mean, obviously the environmental movement needs more than just scientists. We need folks who can communicate well, not saying scientists can't, but communicate in different ways and uh, who can find, you know, unique new personal connections between um, people in place. So that's a long answer yeah. to that question, sorry. No, that's that's great. That's really that's really interesting. Um, I, uh, a second question. So this, uh, you know, you just mentioned before that you also are a journalist and teach journalism. Um, another person is wondering um, what if you could. Another fellow radio guy person is saying, um, "What have you learned about how making radio is different than writing for the page, and how is it the same?" That's great. I've been trying to figure that out. Um, and one way I think it's different. So I do. I do a particular thing uh, for the radio, which is these very they're mini essays. They're like uh, really 300 words, like 100 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I write flash fiction too and, sh and really short pieces. But I think one main difference is that, you know, and fi the fiction is all about conflict. Um, and, you know, my, you know, I, I tend, my fiction tends to be pretty dark. Um, I tried to not depress people today with my reading. So I read some lighter mm -hmm. sections, but I think for the radio, you know, first of all, I decided when I, when I certain radio station asked me to do this, I didn't want to say anything, you know, give my opinion about anything. <laughs> you know, I mm -hmm. feel like the, you know, the world is just full of pundits and prognosticators and, you know, I have political opinions, um, but I, I have no interest in sharing those. So I thought, well, I'm going to do these. I'm going to, I'm going to do, I can tell stories. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm interested in, you know, the um, things that happen outside and with my family. And, and so I, I thought I'm going to, I'm going to, locate these and have that be a thematic link between them. So I call them minor pieces, they're kind of in the minor chord, but they're very short. And um, I would say one big difference is you don't need the kind of uh, really stark conflict that you need in, in, a, in a short story. I mean, I think I try to make something happen in them, you know, and try to have a little narrative and, and some tonal variety, but I don't, um, I don't worry about having a, you know, a conflict. If, you know, people are listening to these as they're driving in their car and you have to be, everything has to be pretty clear, really simple plot, as it were, a really simple story. You don't, you know, they can't page back and read it again. So the language can't be too fancy. Um, mm -hmm. Those kinds of, so those are some differences, I think. Oh, that's really cool. I love thinking about writing for, for imagining a reader who's listening to it in their car. That's a really, that yeah. sounds like a really interesting and helpful yeah. Yeah, way, to, way to think about writing a piece and, and a way to think about editing a piece. Oh, yeah. cool. Do you know, you get, I, you know, I get a much wider audience, I think, through those than through, um, than through writing books. And, you know, my, co my colleagues at the, at the college, mm -hmm. everyone listens to public radio, even some of my students. Every once in a while, mm -hmm. I'll get a student who will email me something about, you know, sometimes students I don't know, you know, it's like, oh, I really like that piece or... If they don't like it, they don't tell me, which is nice. But um, 
yeah, so you just reach different people. Um, and um, yeah. Oh yeah, that seems like another really fantastic way to think about it too, right? People who are, first of all, maybe just accessing it by chance and maybe, you know, first hear your voice before they know what they're listening to. Of course, you know, it's for, they're, they're accessing it for free, you know, all those things that makes it really interesting. And yeah. And, and of course, thinking about perhaps people who are in more rural places who it right. feels like anyway, if you drive more, you listen to more radio. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's one other thing, you know, I've given a couple of talks about this at different places and uh, I gave a talk about this at Minneapolis and it kind of fell a little bit flat, but I, I, mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, but I think it's the, um, you know, the radio, this is North, public radio which is like all across northern illinois and southern wisconsin kind of mm -hmm. to chicago but not chicago so the, also mm -hmm. the, the public radio audience here is fairly uh exurban slash rural not really mm -hmm. suburban urban so it's a it's a a slightly different audience than some public radio stations nice yeah. and I, just one more thing i'd like to add about that radio people are great you know they're really generous with their time you know they'll you know they'll come out and hang out with you and produce stuff and I, besides this little essays i've done some bigger projects with radio and they're just like really great people so nice. nice well our book festival committee member who's a radio guy is probably liking that answer right now who's on the call yeah. um yeah. i also wanted to ask you i guess this is shifting gears again but um i wanted to ask you about the second person point of view in your stories mm -hmm. i you read from one today your second story mm -hmm. you know the the narrator the point of view character um you know has um characteristics like we understand she's female we understand she's from mount horeb that you know her she has her mother passed away you know so she has defining characteristics it's not like a second point of second person point of view that's like any person um and i noticed there's a few other stories in the collection that also slip into that second person point of view i think am i remembering right that lazy b also does and um Anyway, I was just, I thought, wow, you were gloriously unafraid of the second person. And, and I wondered if there's, if you feel like there's something that attracts you to the second person or is it, does it, is it something that just sort of happens? Um, you know, I know grammatically we all casually slip into you really, yeah. you know, easily. Uh, what do you think? What, what brings you to the second person? Uh, um, thanks. Great question. Thank you for the way you phrased that. Luck, you know, um, I think people are trained by bad English teachers early on to sort of either hate the second person or, or whatever. People always say the same, people say invariably the same thing about second person. They're like, second person is great if it's done right. You know, so if you start talking about second person, you'll hear that phrase and it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so is everything. I mean, so is everything. So is first person and third person. And everything. So anyway, I like to experiment. I think I'm, uh, I'm not really a straight realist. You know, I have, um, uh, you know, I, I went to graduate school and, you know, it's sort of the tail end of the sort of the height of postmodernism in the, in the 90s. So, you know, uh, metafiction was, was still a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, experimenting with form and perspective is one of the ways that, um, one of the things I like to do uh, with stories. And so, um, and the other thing is, you know, to get a story right, it's mostly a question of getting the voice right. And so if you, if you get the voice right, or at least if, if you feel like it's right in your head, it might be wrong. The reader might tell you you didn't get it right. But if you feel like it's right, then, then you can tell the story. And so I'll, oftentimes I'll start a, a story in first person because that's, you know, people have been composing sentences in the first person since they can talk, right? So that's pretty mm -hmm. natural. And then I'll, I'll just play with uh, changing perspective. Because another thing is I think that people, writers, as they revise, they don't think of that as something they can revise. You know, they often start mm -hmm. a story and whatever perspective it is, that's sort of locked in there to them. Might revise every other part of the story, but they don't, they don't think about changing perspective. And for me, you know, I'll have a story that seems dead on the page. I'll be halfway through it and I'm like, man, it's not coming to life. And then I'll, I'll change the, perspective around is sometimes I'll hit on something that again just for me makes me uh, gives me enough uh, life and energy to finish the story I mean it's another thing if you you know if the reader says oh that didn't work for me I mean but it has to work for you the writer before it works for anyone right so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so I'd like to experiment with perspective I guess try lots of different things and form that's great I I just want to um, once again put out if there's anybody who has a a burning question yet you can put it in the chat and I'll I'll make sure that that we get it we have probably just a few minutes left so this is just once again a chance to to write your question um, that's good otherwise I guess I 
um, I don't know, what do you think about, how does teaching uh, go along with your writing? I think a, um, a lot of teachers will lie to you and say that, oh, teaching really feeds my writing. And um, you know, that's the popular thing to say. On, I'm sorry, students that are here, they're laughing at me. <laughs> um, you know, that's a popular thing to say on campus uh, as you go for promotion and things. I think, you know, teaching and writing actually comes from the same well. So it's like, you, you know, you're, you're using a lot of the same energy for both of them. So to me, they don't necessarily, um, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, I don't leave a class after teaching all day on Zoom. I don't like come home and like, wow, I'm inspired to write because <laughs> my brain is tired. And that's the same part of my brain that gets tired from writing. So, but, you know, working with young people is every day, you know, rewarding and gratifying and makes me happy and um, also you get uh, for most of the writing is mostly about failure you know you write something you're unsatisfied with it you know you, you think it's not working out then you finally finish it and and um, you maybe have a glimmer of hope that it's somewhat good and then you send it out and it gets rejected a whole bunch of times and and you know and then someday it gets published maybe if you're lucky mm -hmm. so there's a lot of just you know negative feelings associated with that and with writing um, even though I still do it. Uh, but teaching is, is not, is, is much more gratifying. You're just like, you're, you know, you're, you're in, with a learning community of smart people who are hopefully engaged and there's a lot of good energy with that. And you feel like you're, you know, you're being useful and, and you're not failing. Sometimes you're failing, but um, so that's what I would say. Um, there are, sometimes I get ideas from something I read in class or from students writing ideas that stick with me, mm -hmm. but um, they, they really are. They use a lot of the same um, bandwidth or whatever the right metaphor is. Yeah. Thanks for, then, yeah, thanks for I, honest I answer on that. <laughs> I wouldn't say that on, on campus. I would say, oh, yes, I'm learning. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I, I think it's important for people to talk about the well, right, you know, and to talk about our energy and where our, um, you're right, because it, and and but it because it also allows us to acknowledge that writing and teaching both tap into our mm -hmm. empathy you know and our ability mm -hmm. to connect with people and that's probably why people do both but it is also why they they are the same well so you're tapping twice yeah mm -hmm. yeah i want to make sure i give you a chance to say anything in closing uh, in particular where we can um hear more your radio stories or or anything else you'd like to tell the listeners here about how to find your work or access your other projects. Um, and also um, folks on the, you can see that in the chat, there's a link to a survey to fill out about the festival if you'd like to give the festival any feedback. But, but so Chris, let me make sure you get the last word and tell us how to keep finding your work. Um, okay, so the, the station I write for is called Northern Public Radio. NPR, NPR, mm -hmm. um, and I just put it in the chat. So if you if you Google Chris Fink Northern Public Radio or just Chris Fink NPR, they do actually have an archive of all those. I mean, I've got like 50 of them over the mm -hmm. past few years, and they don't take a lot of time. So you can look at those if you're interested. Um, you can you can read the um, the script or um, click on the image and then you can listen to it. Um, I did a cool project this summer with a Wisconsin writer named B.J. Hollers. He did the project, I just contributed to it. And it's, it's called, uh, I'm gonna get the title kind of wrong, but it's called Hope. Uh, um, hope is the thing, how Wisconsinites find hope in drastic times or something like that. So it's a new anthology of essays from Wisconsin writers edited by BJ Hollers coming out next year from the Wisconsin Horse Historical Society Press. And he used that, that quote from uh, Emily Dickinson, hope dies last, uh, mm -hmm. that's not right. <laughs> That's a, that's a quote from Fred Sturkel, Hope Dies Last, uh, which I find depressing. But Emily Dickinson, I don't find depressing. She says, hope is the thing with feathers. And so the, um, the title, Hope is the Thing, is what uh, each of the um, writers had to riff on in an essay. And I wrote about one of the things that I did in my COVID times, which I, is I started an asparagus patch. So my essay is called Asparagus is the Thing with Feathers. <laughs> so uh, a per personal essay about that. So that's where you can kind of locate some of my um, uh, nonfiction stuff. I've got a website, Chris Fink Fiction, I think, that's got the links to some of the stories. Um, but these, the books are still available on wherever you buy books. Um, so if you wanted to get one, that's the other way. But really, I really appreciate you coming, taking time out of your Saturday. And um, again, I really um, appreciate the um, 
that, that uh, Chad and the rest of you are hosting the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. It gives us something to do, um, keeps literature um, and, and poetry and art close to our lives, and uh, gives us a sense of community where it's hard to find these days. So thank you. And thanks to you, Jill. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. All right. We'll see everybody else later on, maybe, for, for more events uh, throughout the festival. There's lots of links there. We'll, we'll keep them up. But um, thank you very much to Jill for hosting. And, and thanks again, Chris. And thank you all for tuning in this morning. We really appreciate it.